Church South in Swan Quarter, North Carolina, which is located on the Pimlico Sound, which is <coughs> off the Atlantic Ocean. They were looking to buy a piece of property to build a church building. They identified a very desirable location in town. And they approached the owner of that particular piece of property about purchasing it to build their church. He refused them flat out. He was not interested in selling. I don't know the details. I don't know whether he was just didn't want to sell in general or didn't want to sell the church. I don't know. But he refused to sell it. So they went ahead and they bought another piece of land. Second choice. Somewhere there nearby. And they built their church building. And they were using it, worshiping it in it for uh, more than a year, I think. Then in September of 1876, a hurricane roared ashore off the Atlantic. And that's a low-lying area. So there's a lot of flooding. A lot like what Houston experienced, I think, a few years ago, the hurricane. And the floodwaters rose and it lifted the church off of its foundation. It literally began to float down a street in town. It bumped into a general store at one point, and at that point, it bumped into the general store, which wasn't floating. It made a right hand turn and floated down a different street. When the waters receded, the church was sitting on the piece of property that they originally tried to buy. <laughs> the owner decided to sell. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but I can only imagine. He might have been afraid not to sell. <laughs> Now, that, that, that event, I've, I've checked it out everywhere I know it, that that event actually did happen. That's not, mm -hmm. I, I saw it years ago in Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. <laughs> and, uh, some of you, I think, have too, because I can see the smile. But that's, that's miraculous. Now, I, it, it probably doesn't fit the perfect definition of a miracle. I mean, it'd be easy for people to say, well, that's just a coincidence. But, I don't think so. God's a sovereign God, and God does miraculous things. The difference is, God does things sometimes that are obviously miraculous, sometimes that are less as obvious, but they, the operation, the work, uh, the result of the sovereign choices of God. But in, in terms of allowing men to perform miracles, that is very, very rare in church history. Biblical history, I should say. Only in three brief spans of time do we find it. Moses, <laughs> the plagues on Egypt, and all associated with that, parting of the sea. 
Uh, Moses was given the ability by God, or at least to participate in that. I mean, Moses didn't do it, but... And then you come down to Elijah and Elisha. And other than the time, of, the time when Moses was uh, on the scene and the time when Elijah and Elisha was <coughs> on the scene, remember Elisha did twice as many miraculous things than Elijah, you all know that story. The only other time, and those were two brief spans of time, the only other time in church history, times of the apostles. Well, you might say disciples before they became apostles, and, we, and then stretching into the book of Acts. And other than that, it's not been the norm at all for people to be associated with the accomplishment of the doing or the uh, effecting of a miracle. It doesn't mean God, I mean, obviously God has done a lot of miraculous things that, uh, that has always been there in that whole expanse of time. One of the ones that always uh, fascinated me is how the Bible names King Cyrus, the Persian king, uh, in scripture a hundred and some years before he was ever born, that he was going to be the king of Persia to uh, allow the Jews to come back after the captivity. That's pretty miraculous. So God's always been doing miracles, but we don't need to think in terms of someone being able to affect a miracle. That, that is uh, very rare. It has happened. It happened in the days of the apostle. And I'm telling you that because today we're looking at a couple of gifts. And uh, the first one is the gift of miracles. And the second one is the gift of prophecy. Got my slide out of order, but here we are in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. <laughs> to another. Now remember, this, this to another means to another of the same kind. Similar to what we looked at last week, which was faith and healing. They're in that center group of five. So let's talk about the limitation of the gifts of miracles and prophecy. And we just sort of addressed that in the comments I made just moments ago. We've all already noted, every week we have noted, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are identified as temporary gifts in 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Six other gifts are grouped with prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, making a total of nine gifts, but they're grouped into three classes in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Miracles and prophecy are grouped in the second class. So here we have them. We first studied the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The word of wisdom, another of the same kind, the word of knowledge. And then another of a different kind, different from the first two, faith, and then those that are like faith, gifts of healing, we've covered those two. And now we're looking at miracles and prophecy. And uh, just the way things were falling for time wise, I'll include the discerning spirits with tongues next week. <coughs> In this, this list of nine, and they're all temporary because of the way they are connected grammatically <coughs> with these adjectives. And there is one from each group mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 8 as being something that will cease. Prophecy is the one in the second group that is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 8. The gift of knowledge was the one in the first group, and the gift of tongues will be the one we'll see next week that's in the third group. I don't mean to bore you with information we've already seen, but the more we see this, we have, we have to come to this and understand, because otherwise we get lost in the details. This is the foundation. This is how we know that some have passed off the scene and which ones. There's some other reasons, but that's the primary foundational reason. And here we see it in 1 Corinthians 13 8, with that representative one. 
Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. We've already looked at that one. The third one in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 is the first class. The first one in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 is the second class. That doesn't mean anything. It's just the way Paul lists them. So let's look at the gift of miracles. The word translated miracles is the Greek word that means power. Listen to the word. The Greek word is dunamis. Dunamis. It is very similar to the English dynamite. In fact, dynamite derived down through the ages, probably into the English. Maybe through the Latin, who knows? But they're related words. It's raw power. In fact, if you look at, and you should open your Bibles there to 1 Corinthians 12. Um, I just want to point out one brief thing. How is it described, the gift of miracles, how is it described in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 10? You'll notice it here in the New American Standard, it says, but to another, the effecting of miracles. The effecting actually is a Greek word, which means the working of miracles. <laughs> the miraculous accomplishes something. The working, the energy, the power of a miracle. So it's literally saying, that which is accomplished by the power of God. So we can define the gift that way. The miraculous gift is to be able to accomplish something of note by the power of God. Those who had the gift could use the power of God to affect certain situations and provide signs bearing witness to God. I didn't put any references there because the references are all right here on the next uh, point. But I just wanted to make it clear that the effecting of miracles, the working of miracles, was not just simply to change the circumstance at the moment miraculously, but it also had the purpose of providing a sign. What was the sign? The sign that God was doing something. Because what was happening before people's eyes was not otherwise <coughs> possible, right? Now let's look at some references. And you'll need to, well, I need to primarily be in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 to begin with. The gift of miracles is mentioned multiple times. <coughs> I actually said the references for this were here. It's actually the next point. Besides, it'll be D, not C. But anyway, the gift of miracles is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. We just saw that. Later on, 1 Corinthians 12, it's mentioned twice in verse 28 and verse 29. It's also mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And that's the one I want you to look at. Not 1 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. So let's turn there. Here they are a little bit easier to see slide. Right here's where we're at. Second Corinthians 12, 12. So let's look at it. Paul says the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. He's talking to the Corinthian church. It's the letter written to them. It's inspired scripture, obviously, but it had a historical context. The signs of a true apostle. He was an apostle. Paul was an apostle. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you. So 
those who comprised the church in Corinth had saw Paul do something that he calls here sign. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. I don't know exactly what the distinction between wonders and miracles, uh, or whether it's just a, well, it's not, it's not something we're going to get into here, so I won't speculate at this point, but obviously the point here is we need to ascertain, Paul associates signs with miracles, and he not only associates signs with miracles, but he associates signs with apostles. Now you remember from first, uh, remember from Ephesians four verses eleven and twelve, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Remember that, and we said those were not gifts. Each one of those designations, prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist, they're all in the grammatical construction of that verse direct objects. He gave apostles. He gave evangelists. So on. They're not gifts. He's referring to men he gave to the church for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ. Now what we learn from 2 Corinthians 12, 12 is that the apostles had multiple, no doubt had multiple gifts. <clears throat> there were certain gifts that were actually referred to or thought of as the gifts of an apostle. Because that's what Paul says here. He says, the signs of a true apostle were performed. And then he says, they're miracles. So, apostle wasn't a gift. Apostle was a, an office, foundational office in the church. That's Ephesians 2.20. The church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But the apostles, as individuals, that group of men, possess multiple sign gifts. One of those is tongues, by the way, which we'll look at next week. And beginning with the apostles in Acts 2, they all have that gift. The only other reference is uh, Hebrews 2, 4. Let's take a quick look at that one as well. Chapter 2 and verse 4. God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So now we see the miracles mentioned in context here as a gift. So we talked about everything we need to mention there. Let's move on and go back to our outline that we looked at previously. Word translate miracles means power. It's a gift that was used. A gift that could uh, be used by those who had it uh, to bring the power of God into play to affect various situations and provide signs because it was only something God could do. Gift of Miracles is mentioned multiple times, but this, these are just mentions of the gift in the epistles and Hebrew. Now we want to go to the book of Acts and look at the historical record. Now remember, the book of Acts is a history book. It's a history of the early church. It's a history of the Acts of the Apostles, some say. Maybe better, the history of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So when you read something in the book of Acts, you're reading what happened. Acts is descriptive. Acts is not prescriptive. This is a major mistake made by those who believe that these temporary gifts are permanent today. 
Because they'll say, well, look what happened in Acts. Here it was in the scripture. They go, not understanding. Acts is describing what happened. It's not prescribing what should happen today. Paul does the prescribing. That's the theology. And that's where we come to 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 1 Corinthians 12, and so on. <clears throat> Acts is just telling you what happened. Acts will tell you what was observed. Luke wrote down what happened, inspired by the Holy <clears throat> Spirit. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on or what a gift associated with it or what the person was thinking or any of those things that, that are other than what's observable. So what I want to do, and what I've been doing already with the others, is showing you possibilities in the book of Acts where these gifts were operative and used. Because Acts is a book of history. I can't tell you definitively, yes, that was the gift of such and such. I'm pretty confident it was. But again, Acts doesn't specify that. Maybe that's why... In all my years of reading and studying on this subject, I've never seen anybody do this, try to identify them in the book of Acts. So you can take what I'm doing here and process that for whatever you think that's where. But uh, this is just a, I, I'm sure someone probably has, but I've just never ran across it. So, but I think it's important because if what we're saying about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 is correct, and we should find it in Acts. In the early church, before it passed away, right? The dead restored to life. Begin in Acts 9, verse 36. You may not have thought about this in terms of a gift. But again, if it was one of the gifts, one of the signed gifts possessed by apostles, we should find an apostle using it, right? What do we find in Acts 9 at verse 36? Peter and the raising of Lydia or Dorcas. Remember that story? She was the one who made clothing for the widows. She probably was pretty well off and was able to supply. And they called Peter because she was sick. And by the time Peter arrives, she's dead. Peter puts everybody out of the room. He prays for her. He comes back to life. A restoration. Possibly. I think Incredible, perhaps, to understand that Peter exercising one of the gifts of an apostle, which is the gift of miracles. Let's go to Acts 20, then another apostle. This time, Paul. Acts 20, beginning in verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Two things. Either Paul was an incredible speaker who could, take, who could keep people's attention far more than anybody else I've ever seen, or uh, these people were incredibly hungry for the word. I think that was more it. They probably wouldn't let him quit. Verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking... He was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. Paul went down, fell upon him. After embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, his life is in him. Uh, when he had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten, he talked with them for a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive. They took away the boy alive <coughs> and were greatly comforted. Apostle, a miracle. What kind of miracle? The dead restored to life. Stephen's cast out. Acts chapter 5. Let's go back to Acts chapter 5. What do we find in Acts 5? Is this the first example of a person falling asleep during a sermon? <laughs> <laughs> not, a good, not a good thing to have. <clears throat> You've all read accounts, and I have, of, of 
people, certain churches, that somebody died, and whatever was pointer just died, and uh, they don't bury the person. And they just pray and pray for days and days, asking God to bring them back to life and so on. That's not going to happen. Thank you. Uh, it didn't really matter. It's not too powerful. Um, because there's nobody there that's an apostle to get the miracle. Right? Acts 5, verse 16. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick, were afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So here's a, just a reference. They were bringing people to Jerusalem, to the apostles, for many reasons, healing. One of the problems was possessed, being cast out. Now let's go to Acts 16. I think you should be familiar with this story. Paul and Silas in Philippi. Before they were cast into the prison, before the earthquake and the, that freed them and all that, they were put in prison because there were some people that had a slow a slave girl that was telling fortunes, predicting the future. Now, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. This was not, this, this slave girl was not operating in the power of God. She was operating on the influence of Satan. Now, Satan does not know everything. He's not omniscient. But Satan's been around for a long time observing people. And he's probably a really good predictor of what's going to happen based on what circumstances are present, right? This doesn't mean Satan is omniscient. This means he's very wise in the wrong sense. And uh, the girl follows Paul and Silas around, uh, and she proclaiming, these men are from God, they're speaking from God. And I, when I read this years ago, I thought, why did Paul get so upset? She was telling everybody he was from Tango <laughs> Dun, right? But, and Paul didn't at first. <clears throat> but it continued day after day until it became a distraction from everything Paul was doing. And then Paul basically turns around and casts out the demon, their owner, her owners are mad because they only lost their source of income because they were charging people for her to predict the future. Paul, an apostle, cast out a demon. I would suggest that's a gift of miracles. A man struck blind. This is Paul again. Paul and, and Barnabas. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 to 12. Elimus, uh, the sorcerer, uh, let's look at verse 12, Acts 13. Uh, Acts 13, verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Papos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar Jesus, or son of Jesus. <coughs> who was with the broke council, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul, sought to hear the word of God, but Elimus the magician, uh, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. But Paul, who was also known as Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him, and said that you are a full of uh, deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight with the ways of the world? And then he strikes him blind in verse 11. By the way, Paul didn't hesitate to call a spade a spade there, did he? <laughs> he didn't say, now, in the interest of being, you know, uh, very sensitive, I won't call you any names. No, he says, you're it, you're this, man. Uh, he strikes him blind. What can you attribute that to? It's either, I mean, it, it either is or isn't a gift of miracles, but I suggest to you quite possibly is. Acts 28, verses 1 to 6. Paul's appeal to Cephas, or after, after his last missionary journey, he's on the way by ship from Caesarea, where they set out to Rome, eventually. The shipwreck. 
everybody, uh, everybody survives the shipwreck, the loss of the boat and the cargo. Uh, they all get to shore, holding on to whatever they could or swimming, and uh, they start picking up driftwood, whatever they can find. They're building a fire and to dry themselves out and warm themselves up. And Paul, this always fascinates me. Paul is the one that told them what was going to happen. Paul started out as the lowest rung of anybody on that ship, a prisoner guarded by a Roman centurion. And by the time they get to Malta, he's commanding the ship. He's telling the, he's telling the captain what to do and what God says. And they're obeying him. He's, he's like, he comes from bottom to top. And now uh, he's walking around. And what's he doing? He's picking up wood. Now, most people who had just ascended to the top rung of leadership would not be acting like a servant, would they? But Paul was, because he understands biblical leadership. Greatest among you shall be the servant of all. He's picking up wood. As he's picking up wood, he gets bit by a poisonous snake. Last one we see. He shakes it off in the fire, goes on picking up wood. No ill effects. By the way, back not too far from where I grew up in the mountains of Appalachia, there are those who like to handle, at least they used to. I haven't heard of them for years. Maybe they kind of, I don't know, maybe they're not there anymore. I'm not sure. But it used to be every time one of them would get bit by a rattlesnake they took out of a cage and was handling in their, their uh, church service and died or something, it would be splashed all over the news in our area. That should tell you something. First of all, don't tempt God. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you don't have the gift of miracles, stay away from rattlesnakes. <laughs> there was a, there was a, a comedian years ago who was in a singing group. I can't think of his name. He had his professor tell you the story he told about going to a church service to sing, and they brought out the rattlesnakes. And he looked over to his buddy and said, where's the door to get out of here? He said, right behind the rattlesnake pins up there. <laughs> and he said, uh, where do you think they would like to have another one? <laughs> Another door. <laughs> anyway. Paul didn't pick up the snake on purpose. No. When it's mentioned in Acts or in Mark 16, it doesn't say anything about picking up a snake on purpose. It says they will pick up snakes. They just Paul picked one up. He didn't mean to. Not not what not something you want to pick up, but it happens, right? Don't give God. But was this a gift of miracles? I don't know for sure. Maybe the least obvious one it could have been. Unusual healings. Acts chapter 5 again. Let's flip back there quickly. Acts 5. This just gets more and more amazing as you get into this. Acts 5 and verse 14. <coughs> we have to go on to verse 15 as well. Verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So uh, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. And then it mentions people being healed in verse 16. Uh, uh, it's Acts is descriptive. This is what people were doing, expecting Peter's shadow to bring healing. Doesn't say that it did. Maybe it did, though. We know that we're healed in the next verse. Unusual healings. Acts 19. Just one other comment, Jay. What's that? In that same context, in verse 12, it says the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. It doesn't say just anybody did it. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you. I should have backed that verse 12. 15. Yes. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders are taking place. And this is mentioned. This. It actually does. I can't imagine why they would have brought people out and laid them in the streets, open to Peter's shadow, unless that inadvertently happened. And, but so it's quite possible. Well, yeah. One version in SAB says they, and they were being healed. Yeah, it says that in, uh, they were being healed. Yeah. The question is, is that, meaning, is that a general description in that verse? Or was it? No, that's part of that. Is it? The people Contextually, the, I think it probably was. Yeah, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together as well as bringing people who were sick or turning with unclean spirits and they were being healed. 
Okay, you're saying it may not have been the same as they were being laid in the street for sure. Unusual healing power. Now there was a gift of healing, and the gift of faith, as we talked about last week too. So how do you separate? I don't know. Again, Acts just describes what was happening. All right, are we finished with the gift of miracles? <laughs> We're not finished with miracles. We all love to have something that's miraculous happen, right? But the gift of miracles. Let's move to prophecy, the gift of prophecy. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy. Chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 10. So let's take a look at prophecy. The gift of prophecy, the Greek word for prophecy, means to make something clear before it happens. That's what the word meant. Now there are those of you, there are those who write and teach who want to make prophecy into a preaching gift. They say, well, prophets deliver God's word, but they also prophesy about the future, and somehow the prophecy part dropped off and we're still preaching God's word. But there is no preaching gift <coughs> other than the gift of teaching is mentioned. Preaching, just the word preach means to proclaim. But you're, when you're proclaiming something, you're teaching somebody something. Right? By the way, if a preacher's preaching but he's not teaching, he's not preaching. And if he's teaching, he's just preaching, right? That's the way I look. So someone is saying there's still a gift of prophecy and it's just those who are gifted to deliver the word of God. Let me tell you something. There are those who have the gift of teaching to teach, deliver the word of God. Why do they need a gift of prophecy to go with it? You know, it would be a duplicate situation. Now, the gift of prophecy, since the word means to make something clear before it happens, that's the meaning of the Greek word, the way it was used in Greek culture, the gift of prophecy involved in delivering messages about end time events and gen and general events, and events of general concern to believers. There's two aspects of what I believe is the gift of prophecy. One was the revelation of end time events. For example, Romans 12, 6. Uh, I won't go to that reference. Let's just go to 1 Corinthians 4, 13, 18. You all know what that text is. Paul talking about the rapture of the church. Nowhere else specifically discussed in Scripture. It's referred to, but I mean, described and, and, and laid out like Paul does it. This is, the, this is this passage about the rapture of the church. So Paul was giving prophecy. Now it got recorded as, as well as part of God's word. God's word has a lot of prophecy. John, no doubt, had the gift of prophecy too. Perhaps he wrote the book of Revelation. Now it wouldn't have required the book of it wouldn't have required the gift of prophecy for God to inspire somebody to write a book. I know that's two separate things, but we have to acknowledge that this could be the case. It's part of this. But there's a second aspect that we do want to talk about here. The gift, the gift of prophecy also involves communicating specific messages <laughs> to individuals about their immediate future. Remember Gene Dixon? Anybody here? Gene Dixon ring a bell? You've been around all that. 1956, Parade Magazine, she predicted that a Democrat was going to be elected president at the next presidential election and that he would either be assassinated or die in office. Well, Kennedy was elected in 1960. He was a Democrat and he was assassinated. That brought Gene Dixon a lot of popularity. She claimed she had the ability to prophesy given to her by God. Although she had a lot of New Age philosophies mixed in. <laughs> so, was that prophecy? Well, what people don't know is that four years later, when 1960 rolled around, Gene Dixon predicted a Republican would win the election of 1960. 
Now, which Gene Dixon prophecy is true? None of them, because she didn't hit. She wasn't prophesying. She's just guessing. Some people are good at predicting what might happen. They don't know. That's not prophecy. Prophecy is revealing what's going to happen and being 100% accurate. By the way, there was a an academic scholar, I can't remember his name right off, who came up with a whole explanation of this, they called it the Gene Dixon effect. Because what you have to understand is, Gene Dixon made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, or so-called prophecies. The town I live in, or nearby, was Raleigh, North Carolina for over 30 years, and she predicted that when they built the big mall there in town, uh, I remember the name of it, that you had a, a multi-deck parking garage, she predicted it was going to fall down. It's still there today. <laughs> Gene Dixon's still going. I mean, long gone. So, uh, she made way more prophecies or guesses or predictions that never came through. And she hit on a few, and the few that she did hit on, the one she's most famous for, she undone herself and was, before it was said and done. The Gene Dixon effect means that, as this uh, particular individual described it, that people remember the one thing someone does predict that comes true, but they tend to forget the many, many, many things they predict that never come. That's not a problem. A problem, 100% correct. Prophets mentioned the New Testament, Agabus. We're not going to have time to get into all this. Agabus, chapter 11, and again in chapter 21. The elders in Antioch, including Paul and Barnabas, were said to have been prophets, or at least some of them were. A man named Judas and Silas are mentioned in Acts, Acts 15 as prophets. <laughs> The disciples of John the Baptist who hadn't heard of Christ until they met Paul in Acts 19 prophesied. And Philip, the same Philip who took the gospel to uh, the Samaritans, Acts 7 or 8, I think it was, had four dollars prophesied to bring back to Now these are all individuals who do not give us end time prophecy. But they prophesied about circumstances and situations specifically in regard to people in those times and, uh, that was immediate concern to that. And Agabus is the best one to just kind of keep in mind. Remember, he's the one that said when Paul, if Paul goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be put in chains. Remember, he tied his belt around his arm or something. That was just a specific prophecy about something of individual concern to Paul. So I guess the rest of these will be the same. Here's the, we're easy to follow this. Of all these people called prophets, only, the only case of anyone giving a specific prophecy that is recorded in Scripture is obvious. That's the only way we can identify that evidently there was a gift that had to do or was used in terms of individuals. Hey, could you repeat that? What you just said. <laughs> My short term memory is so bad. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go back and let me do maybe this will help. These are the prophets mentioned in the New Testament. Agabus, the elders, Antioch, Judas, Silas, disciples, John the Baptist, and stuff. They're just mentioned. They're called prophets. The prophecies are not spelled out. The only one of that list that has a specific prophecy that is given to us what it was uh, is Agabus. And I believe in Acts 11, it was the famine that was coming. In Acts 21, it was Paul's going to be incarcerated. Those, he, he's the only one mentioned that we actually have a specific prophecy spelled out for us. Is that, that, that kind of Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Right. 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 You said it. But he was not an apostle. No. What we need to remember here, and that's a good question. The apostles evidently 
had a range of different gifts. And they were, the primary purpose of that was to be a sign, bring people into the church, come into faith in Christ, and so forth. But there's nowhere it says that somebody else could have also had that same gift. Uh, and by the way, miracles are specifically said to be signs. Um, part of the, one of the gifts were that were gifts or the gifts were signs of an apostle. Prophecy is not specifically said to be. But I think there could have been other people that had a gift of miracles, or gift of tongues, or some of those things. That it's just that the apostles for sure had, a, I think, a broader range. Of that's, that's my Now, <clears throat> there are people today, certain denominations and churches, who claim to be prophets. And I heard someone not too long ago say, in reference to one of these people, that this particular person had made a prophecy or two about him that had come true. But upon further. <laughs> Examination, there was only a couple who made a lot more that didn't come. So, hundred percent right. If it's of God, does God make mistakes? No. Yeah. All right. Any questions about miracles and prophecy? Oh, we're finished. <laughs> a blank screen tells me to be quiet. Jay, let's get back to what you just covered in Acts 21. My takeaway from that episode is, first of all, how do you pronounce this? Agabus? Agabus. Agabus. Uh, He's led by the Holy Spirit because it says he comes down from Judea and the Holy Spirit, he's, he's, you can tell he's led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jews drill, Jerusalem will bind up the owner and so forth. And then the people realizing that, verse 12, they pleaded with Paul not to go. And 13, Paul's answer, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in the Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. To me, the significance of that today, for me, and any other believer that sees his story, is inspiring. And so, there has to be a purpose for prophecy. There has to be, the Holy Spirit is leading somebody to say something that has a purpose or will, it, will edify the church body, which I think this did. Very, very poignant uh, observation. Paul, Paul knew God wanted to go there. That wasn't in question. And Agabus gave his prophecy before a lot of people. They knew then what Paul was facing. But it, the prophecy was about what was going to happen. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that he should stop going go somewhere else, which is what the people interpreted. And in the long run, like you say, they saw God had a purpose beyond what they could understand. My guess is we're going to see some of that next Friday night in the Voice of the Martyrs film. These people who were bound up, who were had been persecuted and so forth, and the testimony about God's power and His grace. Yeah, very true. There's some heartbreaking stories. And there's a lot of persecution going on in this world today. Yeah, so when you say that the prophecies were events that were going to happen, not they were not cautionary tales. They were. Uh, they were not what? They were not a cautionary. In other words, prophecies weren't told to say, hey, if you do this, this will happen. They were. Predicted, basically predicted the future. Yeah. Uh, the, the prophecy, like in Agabus' case with Paul, wasn't 
something God would direct Paul to do. Paul already had that. This was something that was done in the context of the church, bring attention to it. Okay. Like sorry, Mr. Do we need to know the future? Do we really need to know? Do we really want to know? <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know <laughs> what tomorrow brings. But I am really sure I want to know what the eternal future brings. Yeah. Don't you? Mm-hmm. So that's what's emphasized this morning. And again, this is part of signs and things that were in that transitional period. Play it.